world can this possibly be? <laughs> Hi, Debbie. How are you? Hello, Miles. I'm fine. How are you? I love this film, Miles. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that so much. I love this film. The opening segment just grabs you as we see this poor pregnant woman running moonlight behind her white white super white during the night and then you see these somebody coming after her as you know she's frantically running and then we see these okay one i don't know obviously there's there's witch inbreeding going on Fell the witch fell it looks very much like Martin Short uh, character of Frick in Merlin. <laughs> you've got witches there, and you've got I mean witches have a hitman. Who knew? Who knew they've got an enforcer with them? Yes. Then you have that incredible shadow shot, red shadow shot, holding up a baby with horns on its head, and all you get is that silhouette. That is one of the coolest shots, Miles. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, we, we worked hard on that one. That is, and then you go into the title of Demigod. And that is a hell of a way to start a film. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we felt like that, that pre-title sequence really had to grab the audience visually and from a story perspective. And... Uh, so we thought long and, and hard about it. We wanted to open the film on a, on a longer steady cam shot where we got the moon and then we panned over to see our, our pregnant woman and the witches sort of come out of the darkness, out of this nether world um, to surround and, and finally capture her. And then, of course, the, the birth of, of our creature, Karanunos, within the hut. But it, it was very important to me that that opening sequence really grab the audience by the throat so i'm glad to hear it it truly does and to to hold on that silhouette that red silhouette image is just you know it is so amazing it is so powerful and you can't look away you're fascinated by it so to then jump right into the film perfect perfect you're already hooked so now it's okay what is this little horned baby creature um, <laughs> and it's red. <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it's great. And, and I have to tell you, even though it has subtitles for the German part, speaking parts in the film, that opening segment, I was so proud of myself that bits and pieces of German that I remember as a little girl, my grandparents talking uh, you know, I knew right away, okay, Schwester, we've got sisters. Okay, the witches are all yeah. sisters. And the yeah. minute you hear Kinda and, and Kinder, okay, I know we're talking about kids. You know, that, that was all, that's always the tell-all. Whenever you hear the Kinder, uh, yeah. you know, all right, what did I do now? But the strength of your visuals, you don't need, through the whole film, you don't need the subtitles, Miles. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I really do. This, the, the visual palette of this film, the visual aesthetic of this film was something that we, we worked on long and hard and planned. Uh, we shot on anamorphic widescreen lenses. Um, we wanted to embrace flare. We used a lot of steady cam. We used a lot of super wide shots, vistas in our uh, woods locale to, to really embrace and take advantage of that anamorphic look. Um, and we, you know, we, my DP and, and Nate Tape and I, we prepared lookbooks of, of visual inspiration from, from other films or artists or whatever. We wanted to kind of get at this vintage throwback kind of thing to, mm -hmm. to like the early, early 80s. Um, one of the films that kept coming up in conversation was Michael Mann's The Keep. Do you know that film? Yes, I do. Yeah. I, I think Michael Mann is taking his name off of it or something at this point, but... Um, but it has that German folk horror yeah. thing going. Uh, it has a creature, you know, and, and Michael Mann's unique aesthetic. I realized the studio, you know, pushed him around a little bit and made him cut it up and all that stuff. But it still has that Michael Mann panache. And mm -hmm. that, that was a film that inspired us. And, and a lot of the folk horror stuff, like It Comes at Night and Gretel and Hansel that came out last year during the pandemic, um, um, Midsummer, of 
course, uh, the, the the sort of forest, culty, rural horror thing. Um, and I just loved being able to set the film, having this German setting, right, I mean, which was uh, just so rife with possibility um, to embrace that 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 culture and the and the, the people and the language. Um, I mean, about um, I don't know, maybe thirty percent of the film is in German, mm-hmm. um, uh, which was a, a really neat challenge. Um, I have a little German from having gone to graduate school and studied at the Goethe Institute in Munich, um, but but not enough to to really ensure that all the German was right. So we we had uh, a German language uh, coach, Oliver Hopper, in New York, who couldn't come to our set because for COVID reasons, but <laughs> we were Zooming with him and we were FaceTiming him and texting him all, all, all the way and, and sending him line readings. And then we, we had this crazy scenario where one of our actors flew in from L.A., tested positive for COVID, right before she came to set so she, she couldn't do the show oh god um and so we had to juggle the cast in the right in the middle of shooting and but originally elena sanchez uh who wound up, wound up playing latara was going to play that pregnant woman at the beginning mm-hmm. so we bumped bumped her up to latara in this <laughs> cast shakeup. well elena is trilingual she speaks German, English, and Spanish. She has a she has a Spanish parent and a German parent, and she speaks all of these languages fluently. So, so, and we didn't even know that when we made this decision. So Elena shows up on set, and she's like, you know, I, I I'm fluent German. So if you need any help, you know, with scenes, because we were all sequestered at this campground, Little Black Creek, Lumberton, Mississippi. And, uh, nobody was going anywhere because of COVID, and and so that that turned out to be this incredible blessing in disguise to have Elena there, making sure we were on our p's and q's with regard to the Germans. So, mm-hmm. um, well, I love the fact that you steep this, you know, in you set it in the Black Forest, and it's steeped in the mythology of Cernunos. But what I find really interesting. And this obviously goes back to your own, you know, obsession with Greece, Greek and Roman historical <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Because Cernunos, and what I love about how you depict him here, looks very much like the Cernunos um, on the Pillar of the Boatman in, in his visual look, um, which, of course, that was erected, it was... Uh, erected uh, to honor Tiberius. But I love that. And, you know, it goes back to the Gaelic-Roman times. And, of course, Rome took over Gaul. And, you know, I mean, Caesar's Caesar's Gallic Wars, you know, third-year Latin, you know, Gallia is omnes divisa tres. Um, uh, So, you know, I love seeing that. So I knew where... Exact where this came from in your mind originally. It had to have come from your own studies. Yeah, Ternuna, so I, I think it's fascinating. I mean, nature deities and vegetation deities as a general rule are absolutely fascinating. They're always the oldest chthonic deities, right? Because, of course, human beings depended on the land, mm-hmm. right? If you can't make things grow out of the ground, uh, if you can't, you know, wrangle the beasts of the land, you're going to die. So vegetation deities are a very big deal from, from a very early stage. Uh, but they're also not to be trifled with. I mean, they, these are badass, mean deities. You and know, ugly. Uh, if, if you cross them, uh, like Dionysus in particular. But Cernunos is, is generally a bit one of the more, on the spectrum of vegetation deities, a bit more benevolent. But we sort of, we sort of shook that up a little bit, and we, we mustered his... There's some overlap with the, with the Roman underworld god uh, uh, Dispater, and and the and the Germanic deity Herne, who's, mm-hmm. a, who's a god of the wild hunt, and 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 so we sort of embrace those slightly more sinister elements of Cernunos, while while 
maybe not maybe maybe not making him a straight up villain, but making him somewhere someone who is antagonistic in in his in his desire to protect the natural world, even if it's in a twisted sort of way, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, and and in your film, the way you've constructed it, um, Kanunos does have a bit of benevolence in him. Mm-hmm. Um, I was surprised to see that. Um, that I have to say that prosthetic mask is amazing. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Who did the prosthetic work? Not only on his mask, but also uh, for Christian Stokes, for his Grimmer, you know, our yeah. enforcer. Absolutely stunning work on both. So that's a combination of three very talented women. Our production designer, Julie Tosh, um, our uh, makeup department head, Ashley Treadaway, and then Lindsay uh, in her um, role as costume designer. Um, so she designed, for example, the, the Grimmer uh, uh, mask and headpiece. Um, much of the special effects makeup is... Um, is Ashley and, and Julie. Julie was in charge of the Kernuna's mask and, the, and, the, and his prosthetics. And then Ashley did a lot of the gore and blood work that you see. Um, wow. But that, that stuff was, was obviously critical to the film's success. Mm-hmm. And uh, we wanted to do as much of it as we could practically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think they, they really did a, a terrific job because that stuff's not easy. I mean, a mask that you can, you know, actually have a character speak in and and have any ability to emote in is, is a really tricky thing, you know. And so uh, I think Julie did a terrific job with that. Well, and now that begs the question, Miles, because of the mask, the full face mask, especially with Grununos, uh, um, is that the actual production audio that we hear him talking or did you do an overdub or ADR on that? No, it's almost never the production audio with Kernan. No. It's just the mask muffled his voice to, to the degree that it just didn't sound, it, it wasn't going to work. No, but so it we, sounds we, fantastic. Yeah, so we re-recorded all of his lines, and we put a little effect on it to give it a little extra juice mm-hmm. you know, in, in, in our post-sound mix. Um, and we brought, which was cool, because we could really bring the actor in and and by the time we got to shooting the finale, this is, you know, they say never shoot the end of your movie at the end of your shoot. Well, our dumb asses did that. <laughs> I, I kind of, kind of out of necessity, but anyway. So we're, we're, we're getting the end of the movie. We're racing against the weather. We're racing against time. And so we, I really didn't feel like on the day I, I got to work with Chima, who played Carnudos. Chima's more of a stunt guy turned actor we loved him for his physicality mm-hmm. um but i just didn't feel like I, I i quite did him justice as an actor on set so getting him into the studio and then getting to work with him on those lines in post was i felt really really great about because i felt like we could really fine-tune it you know but no all of all of Kernunos is adr wow because it sounds so good and i kept thinking oh my god if this is production sound, this is yeah. amazing. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, it's so believable. Uh, you know, I've seen a couple films of late overdubbed ADR is so bad that there's so much contrast in the ambient tone between that person talking and the person sitting next to them in a car talking that it just drove me crazy through this entire film. So yeah, do- it makes it, it makes you get, uh, appreciate why Sergio Leone just ADR'd the whole movie. Yeah, it's because <laughs> right? it- at least then it all sounds the same. So uh, that's that's yeah, that's the worst, right? When the ADR uh, doesn't feel integrated. No, it doesn't. So- it doesn't match the ambient, and it doesn't match the uh, the the volume and the the tone of the other actors that are speaking. It just takes you out of the movie. Yeah, I- it happens on these huge movies. It's always crazy to me i see these movies with enormous tens of millions of dollars and sometimes more and the adr sticks out like a sore thumb it's yeah. really tough so we knew we had to get that right well and, and so to come out of watching two of these movies within the past 48 hours and re-watching yours again last night it really made me appreciate even more 
and not just Cernudos and his vocal quality, but your whole sound design. You really paid attention so that we get the sounds of nature. So we really feel immersed in this idea of Sir Nunos is the horned one and, and the, the god of the forest and hunting and tracking and flora and fauna. We feel it. We see it. We hear it. And I love the little, the, you know, we can hear leaves. We can hear twigs. Uh, you know, we hear the scrape along a tree, a tree trunk. And I yeah. really love that because it adds so much to a film like this that, what, 95% of it is exterior, outside in the forest. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, the wood had to be, the location had to be a character in and of itself. Yeah. I mean, much like our last film with the dinner party, right? Yep. We knew we had to get that location right. We knew that house had to be imposing and, and labyrinthine and all these things. Same thing with this movie. I mean, we knew that the location had to be a character. We knew that the, the forest had to feel alive and the crunch of those leaves and the, the, the grass under their feet and the, the, the swaying of the trees, all that had to be in the ambient, in the sound world. Um, and, and so we really, and I'm, I'm also, when it comes to sound design, uh, I'm kind of a more is more type person, mm -hmm. not, not to the, not to the like Chris Nolan bombastic degree, but in terms of like the crunch of leaves underfoot, yeah. and so I want to, I want to really hear and feel that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like sometimes that stuff is not pushed hard enough. It just kind of becomes an afterthought, but I really wanted the forest to be alive. Yeah. And, and it comes across, especially when you look at it, look and listen to it through not just the sound but i mean nate's got some really incredible camera shots you know for lay, like laying on his ground on his back on the ground and shooting up amid yeah, yeah. surrounded by trees so we feel the history we feel the centuries the trees look so tall that they become part of the sky and then you counter that and contrast it with your flashbacks um, that are so bright, bright, super saturated yellow and green. And then you punctuate it with the light flares, which I am just gaga over the light flares, especially when you throw in a, you know, a red light flare. And in the flashback where it, con where it melds with the green and the yellow, so you've got stop, look, listen, stop, look, go. And it just fuels the metaphor uh, of the film. And it's like all those little details just make me go gaga. <laughs> well, that's what we're up to. I mean, I, you know, our, our, one of our mottos on this film was more flair. So um, we really did embrace the flair. Um, and uh, and so sometimes we just got very, very fortunate. That in one of the flashback scenes where Jeremy and Rachel are walking up to this log where he's about to shoot a deer, and we were shooting that sort of early in the morning. It was one of the first shots of the day. And we got this halo thing that happened around Jeremy as he was mm -hmm. walking up to the the log. And I was like, yeah, we need to use that. Yeah. That. <laughs> so we just, we, we, we really just got fortunate. I mean, some things with, with anamorphic, anamorphic flair, you have to think about some things. Some things really have to be plotted out. Um, so the, the sunset shot of Carnunos mm -hmm. crossing the ridge of the hill, I mean, we sort of, we, we, that had to happen in a, like a 15 minute window yep. to get it right. Um, so we had been plotting that since we laid the schedule down. Um, but yeah, I saw, you know, the thing that really, uh, I, it was, it was a star is born. I saw stars born shot by, of course, the great Maddie Libertique and, um, and he used anamorphic lenses on that, and he mm -hmm. and, and the flare is just ridiculous, you know. And all of the in the concert scenes and 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 what I was like, I've got to do that. I've got to do that on a movie. Um, and so when we started sitting down and and talking about this one, I was like, what if we shoot it anamorphic? Um, and Nate was like, yeah, I'm game. So we really. The cool thing about uh, working with Nate is he was really willing to play, like you say, is that meant getting down on his back and shooting up, you know, to get the shot, and, um, or or doing some crazy whip hand, or I mean, he was really he was really willing to play. I think a lot of cinematographers play it too safe, 
mm-hmm. you know, because they're, they're afraid they're not going to be able to deliver the image, or if they try something weird that, that it, it, the image will be corrupted, or there won't be enough light, or you won't be able to save it in the color grade, or... Um, and, and with Nate, we were, I was like, from the beginning, I was like, I want to try some some crazy stuff, and you're just going to have to ride with me here, go with me, and, and he did. Well, he was on the ground for quite a bit of this film, Miles. <laughs> you got a well, lot... It wasn't, it wasn't always him, but he wasn't beyond getting... getting yeah. Taking the camera from the operator and getting on the ground. Uh, and and so I, I really appreciated that about Nate. I mean, we, we had two camera operators, but Nate sometimes Nate would just be like, Give me the camera. It's just as easy for him to get on the ground and do it than to tell somebody. Yeah, right, right. But you know, uh, you know, one last thing on the on the light flares. I love the fact that your light flares flare out horizontally. So often with light flares, we're used to seeing a prismatic rainbow effect uh, that is more circular or semicircle. But here, you it it's almost like a nuclear bomb. And the light disperses horizontally. And it yeah. looks so cool. So it's like, almost like Sir Nunes were ta- tacitly being told, you know, that, that he is doing this, encompassing the entire horizon, the entire forest. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, the, the, those lenses, we shot on, on vintage Russian glass. They're Lomo Russian lenses. Mm-hmm. That's the majority of the film is shot on. And um, I think we had one Airy Master Prime, but we, we hardly ever used it because we love the look of the Russian glass and, and the way it flares. I mean, it's just... It's gorgeous. Right. It, it, just, it just rips across the entire horizon when you get it at the right angle. And um, you, you know, we, got, we got this, we got this, this Master Prime, which we were going to use for, you know, close-ups. And, but even then, we were like, we liked the, the sort of slight grit gritty imperfection of the vintage glass Mm -hmm. and one of the benefits of that is that flip yeah no it it's just visually i i just think it's stunning you've got so many little gems and tidbits in here um the way nate has lit the interior grandfather's house in the woods you know with the wood with the wood uh the interior woods the vertical texturing of it offset with all of the mounted heads and not even mounted heads but bones and moans and more bones you know it just looks so well it, it's lit so well and you've got the one scene with the fire going which casts a nice nice back glow warm golden glow and then everything turns on its head and that's where you really shift your tone when night falls and you've got that gorgeous blue black inkiness happening with a single flashlight. And again, why people don't turn lights on, I don't know. But I will never understand this about horror films. I hear something go bump in the night. The first thing I do is turn on a light. But... (laughs) Because flashlights are more cinematic, Debbie. Well, yes, yes. (laughs) But, But you lucked out with that location, with that house, because, my God, in the master bedroom... That gorgeous circular window with the moonlight streaming through. Stunner. Yeah. Absolute stunner. In the daytime, you had a diffused sunlight coming through. At night, you have the pearlescence of the moonlight coming through. And Nate did a beautiful job with lighting and then capturing that. Just absolutely stunning. Yeah, that window was the MVP. I, we, uh, it was... Yeah. Uh... There were several cabins we had to choose from, but when we saw that window, we said, yeah, this is it. Oh, yeah. I mean, really, we chose it. We chose the cabin for that window. Oh, absolutely. I would have done the same thing. <laughs> absolutely. But, you know, you're shooting during COVID. Granted, you've got, you've got a lot of people in your cast for, for, you know, shooting during COVID. But what really strikes me is on top of that, so you've got COVID protocols, you're in a forest, you're working against weather, you're working against daylight hours, you've got all these people, but you have a minor. You're working yes. with Rachel Riles, who plays yeah. Amalia. Mm-hmm. What did that, and you don't normally work with kids in your films. Yeah, um, so that's, that's always challenging. 
uh, when you're working with a minor because the hours the minor can work are quite strict. Um, you can get some special dispensation with approval of the parents in some instances. And uh, Regina, her, uh, Rachel's mother, was absolutely wonderful. She was there with Rachel the whole time. They had a cabin on site. Um, and so she was always there for us to talk to, you know, Regina, if something came, came up or, or, or we needed to ask for a little more time or, or whatnot. Um, and, but you do have to, you know, you can't work a minor for 12 hours. Right. You, you, you know, you can't do it. So you really have to be cognizant in the planning and the scheduling. Okay. How can, how can I schedule her so I can get her out in eight? You know, um, and, but Rachel w was so great and so game and, and, and then, and, and Regina too. And they're just, they're just t total team players. And, um, Rachel Riles, um, has asthma, right? And so she was, so they were a little worried about being on a set in, during COVID yeah. at, at all. Um, but we, uh, the way we were, you know, the, with protocols and the, and the testing three or four times a week, um, I mean, the protocols worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one scare we had didn't actually make it to set. So that's, that's the protocol, right? They worked. Um, it saved us from having to shut the movie down. Mm -hmm. but, but, but you're 100% right. Is like looking back on the logistical challenges of this film that included all the things you ticked off, COVID and COVID protocols, which is not just a budget suck, but a time suck. Yep. Um, uh, the weather, it was a very cold December. You know, there were a couple of nights there where the, the temperatures got into the 20s. Near the end of the shoot, we started getting a, a periodic rain at night that we were having to shoot around. Um, and then working with a minor. Um, uh, uh, and and it, it's, probably, it's probably the hardest film I've done. Mm -hmm. um, it, there were probably more logistical challenges here than I've ever encountered before. Um, and I probably needed, you know, two more days uh, to, to shoot it. Um, but it, it somehow it came off. And I just think it's, I just think it's, we had a lot of really talented people who were there for the right reasons and who were committed to the vision and, and especially this cast. I mean, they were just oh. every one of them, every one of them was game and, and, you know, we would, I mean, the, you know, a after a while running through the woods gets tiring, right? But, um, but they were all like, you know, Rachel Nichols, wonderful Rachel Nichols, uh, you know, I'm just like, can you give me one more? She's like, I'll give you as many as you want. You know, they were just, mm -hmm. they were, they were superb. No, I mean, your, your entire cast is, is incredible, especially when you look at, because you get gory. You don't really get too gory in this film, though. I think the goriest that we get involves this character of Arthur, played by some guy we've never heard of before. Um, you know, not the, you know, one of the best, best scenes I've seen uh, in, in a film. I mean, just absolutely amazing. And you know which scene I'm talking about. Without without giving anything away, um, but this cast you've got Rachel, you play who plays Robin, um, Jeremy London, who my God, either we never see him or he just pops up once in a while. I know Jeremy's worked with you before; he was in the dinner party, um, but we got Jeremy in there, uh, who plays Robin's now deceased grandfather, Carl. Um, there's you, there's, there's Rachel playing Amalia. Then you've got our witches, Elena Sanchez, Lindsay, Ann Williams, Sarah Fisher as the little frickish fell, <laughs> Christian Stokes as, as Grimmer. And then we have our other, you know, Robin's husband, Leo, Johans Miles, wonderful. And then you've got your, your other supporters because everybody's been taken prisoner. They've been kidnapped. By the witches. Uh, because, you know, Sir Nuno's, he gets hungry and he needs to be worshipped. So then you've got Tatiana Piper, who is Katya. I mean, I love 
you're casting in your design of the character of Katya because she comes across as being a badass, but then when she's alone in the woods, she's the first one to whimper, simper, and cry. So yeah. I love that you turn that. You've got Man and Pages as, you know, our hooker. Mm -hmm. it, it's Germany. It's the Black Forest. You got, okay. And, <laughs> and you know, and then Mike Mayhall um, as her quote-unquote boyfriend slash client which I just think it's so funny the way you, you introduce this as people are trying to hide who they really are. Um, but your cast, everybody is really up to snuff on this one. Uh, I love in your construct, your pacing, the manner of how you're building tension with the chases and the hunt through the forest because the whole thing is about you know, he is the horned one, the god of hunt and tracking. And, you know, he can smell fear, just like Fel can apparently smell fear. Yeah. Um, which, I gotta say, Sarah Fisher, she had her nose down to the dirt so many times. Uh, <laughs> yeah, her physicality in this was just... Wow! Um, that was another, that was another uh, result of the casting shakeup. We had her playing that role. Um, so it was it, it, once again, it just turned out brilliantly. Um, Sarah has a background in circus performance and clearly walking, and, this sort of, and, and that physicality really, that background really came to play. You could, you could tell. Yeah, I mean, just amazing. A weird looking little troll. I mean, so kudos to the makeup there. But, um, you know, absolutely outstanding cast, Miles. But, you know, a big question though you are on screen. For so much of this film, how do you juggle? How do you juggle the hat, the hats of director and actor when you are on screen this much? Well, you you absolutely have to have a team of people that you trust, and we've assembled a team over the course of the last few films that really allows me. Um, to be in front of the camera more and to and to not worry that the film is going to suffer, the vision is going to suffer as a result. So that includes, of course, Lindsay. Unfortunately, Lindsay's character, my character, were not are not on screen so much together, and so she would often be at the monitor as serving in her role as producer and costume designer when I was on screen. Um, Wesley O'Mary, uh, who's al who's also a producer on this, and and then. Um, and then Nate, of course, I, I feel like probably of the of my this is the one that comes closest to capturing the 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 visual uh, intent of, of what we what we set out to do mm -hmm. in the beginning. Because every film, of course, certainly every indie film, you have to make sacrifices during shooting for one sure. reason or another because of time or some some a location falls through or some some logistical nightmare that comes up. Um, but we had this one plotted out. Um, we knew what we wanted to accomplish. We had this very specific visual aesthetic, and we came pretty damn close to achieving that. Um, mm -hmm. And given all the logistical challenges that we were talking about before, it, it, it's really a small miracle. Um, so Nate knew what I wanted. He was very clear about what I wanted um, going in. So I didn't feel like the vision would suffer somehow or that, that he could, he would somehow lose sight of that if I was in front of the camera for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, there's always playback, but sometimes you don't have time for playback. Right. Um, you can't go and watch every shot, every scene, every performance. Um, if you've been in front of the camera, then you have to, you know, there's just not time on an indie film. So it's about, it's about surrounding yourself with people that you really feel like you can trust who, who are really going to keep you honest and who are going to tell you if, you if you have it, and even better, if you don't. If you need to go again, or something's not quite right, or you need to think about reframing, or whatever, or mm -hmm. flipping a lens, or something like that, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm really curious, Miles, because you know you, independent filmmaker, and now you've got all these these COVID protocols. They are still in place. Granted, testing has it's gotten easier for a lot of filmmakers now. You can get you know rapid test done so you know by the next day you know you got a 24-hour turnaround if not quicker 
uh, to make sure everybody is COVID free and that you're set safe. But how does this impact you now with all of these protocols, which, you know, obviously aren't going away? What does that do for you in terms of your creativity and what you have to consider now in weighing your vision against what you can realistically do with a budget? Because these protocols add so much cost. And now we're looking at a potential IATSE strike. So <laughs> as an independent filmmaker, um, how does this impact your filmmaking? It's, um, it makes it really, really hard. I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, the budgetary uh, impact alone is daunting, you know. Um, I imagine, I imagine on this show something in the ballpark of maybe twenty to twenty-five grand was devoted to COVID protocols. Wow! On an on an independent film, that's a that's a big chunk of money, you know. Um, and it, it's you know the testing. Like I said, it's not just the cost of the test; it's the time that takes yep. the test, right? Which you're which you have to incorporate into your day. If you're going to call people to set to do tests, that's you know that's part of the day. I mean, and, and it, even if you if you test on the day off, you're supposed to pay people for the test. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like um, it's it's tough. I mean, I, I, my hope is that um, the I haven't read the revision of the work return to work agreement that now includes uh, the va vaccine mandates and, and how that impacts. Uh, the set and the, the, the zoning and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm hoping it means if you if you require vaccines that that if somebody's been vaccinated they don't have to be tested as much. But I I don't know. I once again I haven't read it. But um, it, it, it's I guess I've come to accept the fact that as an independent filmmaker um, there are always going to be challenges that make the prospect of completing a film seem impossible mm -hmm. I mean, even before covid that was a, that was out there yeah like, how does anybody make a film for the the budgetary amounts that we have at our disposal um but you just have to want it enough to to overcome you know you, and and uh i i think that it, it but it does change the way you think about you know like i've got another script that i'm i'm that i'd like to shoot next year and i'm like <clears throat> it's how long will COVID protocols be what they are? You know, will, will things shift by the spring or the summer? Or will we be in a, a slightly different place? And um, I think that um, this, a movie like this that has so many other logistical challenges, I would not try again under COVID protocols. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, uh, we were very, fortunate we, we had a lot of people really talented people on top of their game um giving their absolute all to make this film a reality but with all the other logistical challenges we were talking about whether it's the the large majority of the film is exterior the weather working with a minor all those things put together plus you can't buy your way out of anything the way a studio film can you can't buy your way out of anything you have to improvise you have to you have to figure it out on an indie budget um, I don't know that I would do a film with this many logistical challenges under COVID protocols again. So mm. I, my hope, my hope would be that as we as we move forward and and vaccination numbers increase and uh, hopefully there are no more variants, you know, certainly hope there aren't any that are vaccine resistant, um, that we'll be in a better place moving forward. Yeah, because I don't want to see, you know, my fear for filmmakers, especially someone like yourself who is so creative that, you know, you're going to have to put a damper on some of that creativity, something you might want and see as part of your vision for a film because of monetary costs associated with the protocols, you don't have the money to fulfill that creative vision. That's yeah, always I, I mean, my, I, that's my fear. I, I think, I, I, and I, you're right to, to be afraid of that because it's like, it's, it is a consideration. I mean, my the the, the latest script I wrote, I've we, we've gone smaller. It, it's it's 
it's more intimate. It's more character drama. It doesn't mean I, I, I don't think it's any less creative or less weird or less you know, <laughs> wonderful, but, but it's, it is definitely smaller and it definitely has a limited cast and, and, um, it, 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 it's definitely far fewer exteriors than, than demigod. So, um, you know, I, that's kind of how you have to think about it. You can go, okay, if I'm going to have to spend this money on COVID protocols or whatever, then I have to save money in other places. And how can I go about doing that? Because I, you don't want to sacrifice your vision. You don't want to sacrifice the creativity. Um, but the truth is, I look at it as, look, I've been wanting to, to get back to my roots in sort of character drama type stuff mm -hmm. uh, for, for a while now. And so this kind of gave me an excuse. I, Lindsay and I wrote this new script together. We actually finished it during the... Uh, during our exile from New Orleans uh, during the Hurricane Ida uh, while we were in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, and I, I said, you know what, let's, let's write something small that we can get, you know, uh, people we know um, that sort of, you know, I love the films of Noah Baumbach. I love mm -hmm. the Sofia Coppola stuff. I, you know, I, I, uh, so I wanted to write something that felt a little bit like that, but, but with our own, you know, weird stamp. So, uh, I, I, you know, uh, maybe it's a blessing in disguise. I you, you go smaller, but don't go less creative. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of my thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Which is hard to. So now with the new script, are we going to have bloodshed in the new script? You know, I live for that. <laughs> um, uh, it's got a little bit of a thriller element. Okay. I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't call it a horror film. It, and uh, there is a little bit of blood in it. Uh, but, you know, um, it's not it's not demigod or dinner party blood. Um, it, it's it's almost like it's almost like a, a, a black comedy romance. Oh, okay. Um, um it's uh, it, it's kind of like if 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 Marriage Story had a baby with a one car Y film <laughs> and, was, and was a quasi musical. <laughs> Oh my god oh my god miles what okay i i don't know if COVID has affected your brain or if hurricane ida affected your brain um that's something that's something but as long as there's some kind of blood bloodshed in there you know you're yeah, feeling you, you've got to have some um that is that's requisite you know because god forbid that you ever don't have the money to budget for bloodshed and kills, I will really be heartbroken. Yeah, well, we're gonna, yeah, we're we're gonna spill a little blood, uh, for sure, and and with um, we're gonna, it's it's wacky, it's it's wacky. I, I uh, but I'm really excited. I'm really excited about it. It's a it's a big departure from the last two films, and um, I think folks are gonna enjoy it. Well, am I gonna enjoy it? I, I mean, I, I think, are, are you, is your taste, do you lean toward gore and, and the macabre and the, you know, that sort of stuff? Or did you, how do you feel about, like, those, some of those films that I mentioned, the more character drama you kind of stuff? Oh, no, I, I like character dramas. Um, you know, I love The Historian, the first one you did. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I I love that. But I also love, you know, the thriller aspect. I don't like gratuitous horror just for the hell of it. Right, right. I like it when it's purposeful. Like right. with Dinner Party, that was extremely purposeful. It had to be an interesting dinner party, and it was. Mm -hmm. You know, you have seven courses. You have to have entertainment for each one and a little blood with right. each one. You know, right. Demigod, this is, if you did not have kills and bloodshed, that's the whole point of Sir Nunos. That's the whole point uh, right, of the right, mythology. Right. And I, right. I love films like that where it's not gratuitous, where it is a necessary component to the story. Not just throwing it in for throwing it in's sake, as so many films do. Yeah, it's gotta, it's gotta be, it's, it's gotta, it's like, it's like anything. You it know, has like to be purposeful. Nudity. It's gotta be, it's gotta be story driven. Yeah. It's gotta, it's gotta have a, it's a purpose. Otherwise, it just feels cheap and gratuitous, exactly as you're saying. Yeah. You know. I mean, I'm open to, you know, I mean, I'll watch. I do, but I will willingly watch just about anything. 
but I real I love I love where we get something like like demigod where it is a, it's an element of the mythology of the story of the characters and it essentially the hunt here it the hunt in and of itself is a character yeah right the entire premise of the hunt sacrifices for the god yes yes you know it that well, becomes I mean, I, mean I, I will never i will I, there will always be a film there will always be a place for me uh, uh, in, uh, with regard to films with rich mythology and ritual and history yeah. and all that. I mean, that's just the sandbox I love to play in. So I'm not going to be too far away from that for very long. Um, but I, I did want to. I, I did want to do something that was very different, and I the, for the next one. And I did. Um, I've been promising that I would write Jeremy London a lead role in something for a few years now. So I finally did. Um, and it's just. It's a little meta. It's a. It's it's kind of it's. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, um, and I think it's something that we could probably shoot and do justice to, even if we still have COVID hanging over our heads. Oh, and the fact that you know it's a leading role for Jeremy—that's exciting. That's that's terrific. Well, this has been uh, breaking news. I haven't talked to anybody in the industry about that about this project. So but I'm not. First. But I'm not just anybody. I know. I know you're not. <laughs> I was there day one. You were indeed. You were indeed. <laughs> oh, my God. This has been so fun, Miles. I can't wait for you. I can't wait for the live show uh, when you call in on the 11th. Oh, that's going to be fun. That's going to be so much fun. That sounds great, Debbie. You are the best. It's always a joy talking with you. Um, you know, I wish I made a movie every six months so we could I wish you did. I wish you did, too. That would make <laughs> That would make me real happy. You have a wonderful day and weekend, Debbie, and I look forward to talking with you again on the 11th.